going, going to go into airplane mode, so I don't know what you're doing. Ah, that's the report. Amir. Okay, I guess we're all ready. Well, good evening and welcome to, I guess, yes, I guess it's good evening. Um, welcome to America Society. My name is Carolina Scarborough. I'm the Assistant Curator for Public Programs. And uh, I'd like to, again, welcome you to our second panel of our series of public programs in discussion. I am reborn at every moment, contemporary reflections on Feliciano Centurion and AIDS. And this uh, program is also organized in collaboration with Visual Aids, uh, which I'm very happy to, um, we're delighted with. And I also wanted to tell everybody that this is stream live, and you can go, if, if you want to tell friends, so you can just go and click on our website and you'll be able to watch it on the web. Uh, first of all, I want to start uh, thanking Visual Aids, Blake, Pascal and Kyle Croft next to me, and our speakers for being with us here tonight. It's really great to have you. And I also want to uh, thank Jaime Iglesias Luking, um, our director and chief curator, and my colleague Diana Flato, the assistant curator. Uh, I also want to remind everybody about our uh, exhibition downstairs, Felician Feliciano Centurion Abrigo. After the panel, it'll still be open for a little bit. And I also want to invite everybody to our upcoming programs. On Saturday, March 7th, this coming Saturday, we're delighted to have Jacopo Crivelli Visconti. He's the curator of the 34th Biennale of Sao Paulo, uh, opening in September. And it's, uh, this panel will be organized in collaboration with Independent Curators International. And then on March 12th, we'll be presenting our first event in our performance series with Ophelia by Anna Massé and Regina Parra in collaboration with the Museo de Arte Archi de Sao Paulo, Assis Chateaubriand, the MASPI. And yes, yeah, so please check our websites and I hope to have, I, we look forward to having everyone here. And without further ado, um, I'm gonna present our speakers and then I wanna um, give the microphone over to Kyle. But we have uh, curator Bill Arning, artist Electra Cabe, uh, Carlos Mota, and Gonzalo Casals, thank you. Thank you, Carolina. Um, I'm Kyle Croft, Programs Manager at Visual Aids. If you don't know, Visual Aids uses art um, to fight AIDS by provoking dialogue, supporting HIV positive artists, and supporting the le legacies of those who have been lost. Um, and we're really happy to be here tonight, thanks to the America Society, um, and Carolina, and Aime, and Diana. And um, a big, I just want to let you know a little bit about what Visual Aids does. A big part of our work is our online artist registry, which is a database of artwork documentation by artists living with HIV and those who've been lost to the epidemic. Um, and so since about 2016, we've had a few images of Feliciano's work on our website, and that was one of the few things that came up if you searched his name. And for a lot of the artists that are on the registry, we're kind of the only representation that they have online. So it's always really exciting to see a show like this where there's so much more visibility and all the work is one place. And now there's this great little book. Um, and that's kind of like what we try to do at Visual Aids is just support, support those legacies. Um, so I'm gonna let the panelists take it from here. We're just gonna stump, jump straight into some presentations, starting with Bill, and then we'll open it up to a conversation with Gonzalo. Yeah, please, joining, please join us in welcoming our wonderful speakers. Okay, I don't know how to move this. Oh, there we go. That's the show. There I am. Okay, um, I'm here um, because in 1995, I was invited at the space called Rojas, which is a lot where uh, Feliciano, a lot of artists were involved to curate a show. Um, and what happened was two years before, I had been invited to go give a lecture there and meet artists of Argentina. And I went down and 
in terms of my own curatorial practice, I was running a space called White Columns at the time. I had never thought I was going to be talking about myself and my life in my curatorial work. I always thought I was sort of trained that a good curator was like a like invisible and was just the conduit for the artist. And then when AIDS happened, an entire generation of us sort of start going like, no, we actually have to talk about our real lives to do anything meaningful here. And um, so when I, I had done a show with ACT UP at White Columns, and I had included that uh, in the show, uh, and uh, in the lecture I had given in Argentina. And it was at the University Gallery, um, and Jorge Gumi Meyer, who's a total visionary uh, artist and artist curator, had, it was really, he said it's really radical to see someone from, um, give a lecture from an out perspective. And we went out to dinner, and he's like, at the end of the dinner, it's like a very bibulous night, and he has his arm around me, and he's like, I want you to do a show in my space called Just a Bunch of Faggots from New York. And I was like, well, let's work on the title, but I like the principle. And it was, I had also done a, a Stonewall 25 show at this point, and it was, um, so it was sort of an extension of the artist I had done there. And it was, when I look back on the show now, it was somewhat naive. It was very sort of universalist. Well, we're all dealing with issues around AIDS. We're all dealing with issues about how to have sex during an epidemic. We're all trying to figure out how to have fun. And in that first discussion with Gumi, Jorge Gumi Meyer, we had talked about this effect on artists who were getting diagnosed in their studios. And that there was a, a, a liberation thing that happened when you no longer were making work to please other powers, but you're like, no, I've got to do my prime work now. And we were particularly talking about Omar Shurilio, who was Gumi, uh, Gumi's lover, who had was sick at that point, and how it had changed his work. And I realize now it's true with Feliciano too, although I didn't know it at the time. I didn't know he was sick at the time. I mean, I guess from what I understand now, which I only learned from the show, was that he didn't know. And he was, it was much later on when um, he found out that he was HIV positive. So I asked a lot of artists that I had worked with for the White Columns Stonewall show and had worked on the ACT UP show to, if they wanted to participate in the show, and everyone was really interested. And this idea of somehow creating this dialogue. Um, Rojas did not have a budget in any meaningful sense of the word. Uh, there was no shipping budget. There was no insurance. There was no security. It was in a space at the university that was open 24 hours a day. People were walking through. So, you know, I always say there's no creativity without constraint. We, I, what I could do in the show was very limited. Um, the show, I mean, we did go for what would now would probably be an unacceptable answer of a show that was all male. Uh, but since the show was called Faggots, it seemed to sort of make sense at the time. Uh, it, that also seems sort of naive to me now. <laughs> uh, Bob Gober asked for a piece. Um, and he had just done this, and there were, um, he had made thousands of versions of it, which were bundled up together for an installation. And it's a picture of the artist in a wedding dress, as if it's that. And then on the, on the top, there's an, um, uh, the Vatican uh, uh, condones a discrimination against homosexual stories from the news. This also piece has aged really strangely, because we, at the time, gay marriage in America was an unthinkable proposition. Uh, that it was going to come to pass in our life. And, um, and definitely, when, when I was in discussion with, about this piece in Argentina, people were like, well, that's never going to happen here. And uh, watching the progress around the world and how, and also, remember, this was a very fraught topic. A lot of people were very angry that that was where the gay uh, movement was putting its energies, was this most conservative of institutions. Um, this piece was uh, uh, marked on the back not an artwork, not for resale, because I, I let him know that this was, um, the, the space was not protected. This was the first piece from the show that got stolen. Uh, and I keep thinking someone in Argentina has this framed in their house, thinking they have a full 
uh, Gober piece, and uh, but no, they like their friends don't know any better. Uh, but it was kind of fascinating that this was the first one that got stolen. Uh, Eric Hansen, who at that point was my my partner and is here tonight, um, showed uh, his cruising mobiles. These were unlike the way it's photographed; these were hung in space. And they were sort of models of, I always said, dystopic gay bars, because people would circle around forever without ever actually talking to each other or connecting. And it was like the most horrible night of the gay bar when everyone's posing and moving around in circles. <laughs> uh, he was also photographing non-traditionally aestheticized body types. Um, uh, I think it was kind of before I knew the term bear, but uh, Eric taught me the term bear in making these pieces. Uh, and um, so these were these wonderful pieces that would sort of circle around forever. Um, uh, Candy asked Kerry Leibowitz, who had a marvelous retrospective a couple years ago. Um, he was like, can I just fax a piece in? And I'm like, Sure, um, that solved the shipping problem, and it, it also dealt with the history of mail art and stuff that we were interested in. And he just faxed this very long ribbon of a text that said, do drag queens in Argentina find singing Don't Cry For Me Argentina as funny as we do in North America? <laughs> um, they don't. They don't. Yes, I did learn that. because. Uh, uh, um, um, and it's, the legacy of Ava Perón there is very different than here. And, uh, and having just seen Patti LuPone and company and realized I saw her in uh, uh, 40 years ago doing uh, Ava Perón, that piece has a new resonance for me now. Um, John Lindell is a marvelous artist, and I don't know how many of you would have seen his work, because he hasn't been showing in about 15 years. Um, he did orgy diagrams. Um, and this was also how to look at sexuality during the middle of an epidemic. And each of those shapes, there's testicles, there's nipples, there's buttholes, there's cock heads. Uh, and he would sort of like, see, how do you diagram an orgy? And these were painted directly on the wall. You got a sort of set of body part templates. And we could install it. Actually, Eric, did you install this? Yeah, I think you may have installed it for me. Um, and it was just one of those really marvelous things he did he was part of the original ACT UP Grand Fury circle and was really active in doing a lot of the, the, the poster work that we came to, that came to be so historic. Um, Joe Mama Nitzberg, who at that point was just Joe Mama, uh, before he decided to remarry his earlier Jewish self of Nitzberg and uh, kind of bring his identity back together, he made a wall of t-shirts. And uh, it says, her death equal the end of our silence. And we had been just been dealing with the legacy of Stonewall. And uh, this refers to the uh, idea that the reason Stonewall happened was everyone was so upset after going to Judy Garland's funeral that they had yellow bricks in their hands, foam relic yellow bricks, and that was the first thing thrown at the cops. Um, and it's a marvelous t-shirt piece. I think he sent 25 down, and we had them all up on the wall. Um, 90% of them were stolen in the first week. Uh, Anthony Vitti, who was doing work very uh, uh, much about blood and the fear of blood, um, was doing these, work, uh, these pieces about the risk involved in trying to have sex during the middle of an epidemic. He would have his blood drawn. He would get naked. He would be basically like humping the, uh, these wood panels. and. Um, doing this in really powerful work that were made, they don't take beautiful abstractions, but what they really were was uh, about bodies in the middle of an epidemic and how do you conceptualize your own blood as something that's toxic. Rob Clark, this is not the piece he showed, and we had a wall of these drawings. He, uh, sort of Tom of he was a Canadian artist, Tom of Finland meets Disney, and um, they were really, really funny pieces. And, we, we, uh, and he had to send a whole set of the original drawings down for that. And um, Gabriel Martinez, who, um, Cuban artist, uh, been based in Philly for years, um, he did street posters that he had done in New York, he'd done them in Philly. And he was dealing with gay cultural anxiety about things like bald spots, um, uh, he would get these uh, sort of like pimples when he would shave. So he decided that the way you deal with um, anxiety about a body part is you make posters of it and you hang them over the streets. 
So the students went out and um, did uh, and put them all over the streets. So his bald spot and razor stubble were all on the streets. We also had some pieces I don't have illustrations of, one of which was by Frank Moore, a great artist who did the Red Ribbon, uh, was one of the authors of that project. He had uh, done pieces around uh, BDSM images in gay porn, but then combining them with um, anal pa uh, pairs, which was a device used to kill homosexuals during the uh, early modern period, where it was cranked open, and it was about this, like, the violence of images. Um, I, uh, the gay student group, uh, the papers covered the, sh the show widely. The, um, the gay student group came to me and they were like, we're gonna put up posters in the bathrooms saying if you're gonna have sex, and this was in Spanish and English, please use, use a condom. And I liked that they actually put that up in the men's and the women's room, uh, since the idea of exactly what two women would do cruising in a bathroom with condoms other than make funny shaped balloons was not really clear. Um, and I asked Gumi, I said, is this, um, is this a tea room? Is this a place where students meet for sex? And, uh, and he's like, no, no, no. And we don't call it tea room in Argentina. That's a very American, that's a very cultural term. And he was, uh, and then Eric went back to photograph the show a couple days later and found out and found students in the space using it for sex. So my show, it, it, we never know if culture has an effect, but I might have created a new public sex site in Argentina. Um, what was interesting was the dialogue we had with the artists of the Rojas. We did see that even though we were a, a half a world away, we were all dealing with the same ideas of discrimination and how to live during an epidemic. And there was this, it seems naive now, but there was a sort of utopian sense when we would all go out afterwards. And I got to meet the artists of the Rojas and they were uh, not all gay, which is funny because you think about the way it's written about now. So there were artists like Marcello Pombo and Sebastian Godin and Graciela Hasper. Um, I live today in, in, um, in Houston and is a gallery called Security where a lot of these artists still show. So I get to see them coming through. I want to end at Art Basel, Miami this year. There was a Buenos Aires focus, and I, uh, I and Graciela Hosper had done her, her first public piece. She's a best known as an abstract painter, but she'd done this beautiful outdoor, brightly colored piece. And she remembered there was a particular artist in BA during that trip that I had the hugest crush on. And I would follow him like around a puppy, like uh, 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 Alfredo Londebeer. And he said, she's like, oh, Bill, I need to talk to you. Did you know Alfredo died this year? And I did not know that. And I haven't seen Alfredo Londebeer in 25 years from when the show was. We were Facebook friends in the nature of social media today. But I still remembered his voice. And when I got contacted about this show, what I remembered was the sound of Feliciano's laughter. Uh, and there's a video downstairs where you get to hear him talk. And I think about those connections and the naivete of that we thought that we could actually bridge all the cultural distinctions with a show as simple as this. Uh, uh, and it's interesting to like hear the way it's reverberated down for the last quarter century. So thank you for being here. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Electra, um, Electra KB. Um, I wrote a poem uh, about Feliciano and the way um, his work impacted me as a person and the way it impacted um, my work and my life recently uh, after watching the documentary and reading his poems. So here it goes. A Feliciano, Feliciano. There I call you my kindred soul, even though I never met you. You imagine a world where men disappeared and woman conduces the motherland. Desaparecer el hombre, la mujer conduce la patria. Growing up in matriarchy, a tender feminine boy, growing up in a matriarchy that demanded a masculine performance. You were not ready to embrace this betrayal of your soul. You couldn't embrace your femininity until your adult life, when it exploded through the hands of your grandmother, your hands. 
You don't need anybody's permission anymore. You'll forever crave the nurture and love that the woman in your family gave you, and you, for, you will forever seek to materialize it. Sick bodies carry enormous weight, enormous pain, and enormous craving for love and tenderness. Always afraid of not being able to fight off the next wave of attacks on your fragile shell, but inside feeling like you want to eat the entire world. And there is so much you want to do. You want to do it all. The eternal gaze you left us. Esos ojitos tuyos que nos miran. The tears in those eyes sewn into cloth. This is where you and I meet. This is where I want to be. On this radical empathy dance floor with you. Feliciano, arrópame desde ese cielo en donde estás. Cover me with your abrigo. Um, that's what I felt looking at this uh, photograph. I felt like um, I wanted to be there. I wanted to uh, be in this space. Um, it invited me. Um, this is Feliciano's self-portrait. It talks about uh, the importance of love and the importance of um, deconstructing what love is and how his love uh, went uh, beyond uh, romantic love and he really created uh, a community uh, based on that. Um, this is the work that spoke to me the most, um, but I didn't choose one work to talk about. I, I chose uh, a symbol, an image, uh, which is uh, the eyes. The eyes say so much in this particular work um, because he made this work while he was battling um, an AIDS-related uh, illness. And um, I am myself chronically ill, and I've been um, battling illness since I was a teenager. And I found that um, that this common uh, aesthetic thread united us, and I found that such a um, such a uh, love connection, such a, a big coincidence, that in times of sickness, uh, you're you're searching uh, for that gaze that will offer you care, that will offer you tenderness, because there is no bigger fragility in the soul than um, being a sick person. So uh, for me, this was um, the strongest voice that spoke to me in his work. Um, this is my piece, uh, Bodies of Water, Body as a Prison, Prison as a Body. Um, I was corresponding with a political prisoner, Marius Mason. Uh, he's the first transgender uh, political prisoner uh, to transition uh, under federal custody. He's held right now um, at the uh, women's prison in Texas. And um, I corresponded with him. And he talked about the, the uniformity uh, that is uh, needed inside uh, the prison system uh, and how he couldn't express his gender. It reminded me of Feliciano growing up. He was uh, forced to perform masculinity, even though uh, everyone in his family was a woman. It made me think about the times uh, where he grew up under uh, the dictatorship of, um, I don't remember his name? Uh, Stroessner. Under the dictatorship of Stroessner, uh, then it ended in 1989. So there's a common thread there with, um, with this work uh, that speaks about you know, somebody that is tortured and hidden uh, by the state, but also about Feliciano's poems about water. Eh, reflejaba el agua que tomaba a sorbos lentos y espaciados, suspendido en algún misterioso recuerdo. Lejos en las grietas, el agua se posaba cristalina y obscura, como el lamento que no cesa. Um, the water was, uh, the water that was being uh, drunk <laughs> was reflected, uh, small sips, um, slow and spaced out. Uh, suspended in a mysterious memory, far away from the cracks, water um, would repose, I don't know, uh, crystal, 
crystalline and obscure, like the lament that um, doesn't cease. Yes, thank you. <laughs> it was difficult to do on the go. <laughs> um, so um, water is extremely politically charged. Uh, water is uh, how, how migrants travel. Water is how um, um, uh, our continent was colonized. Uh, but uh, water also adapts to anything. And uh, speaking with uh, Marius Mason, um, uh, this is me dressed as Marius Mason. Uh, speaking to Marius Mason, he told me um, um, he wishes to be um, like water is because water adapts depending to the container where it's held within. Uh, Marius Mason was uh, charged uh, with, uh, with terrorism um, and ha for um, the charges are connected to the Earth Liberation uh, Front actions um, during the Green Scare. And um, the charges are uh, burning down a Monsanto research facility uh, when the suicide seats were uh, making people starve in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Um, so uh, this is the first uh, work that I wanted to show you. Um, it's a two-channel video. Um, that's a shot of the installation. Um, this was uh, um, Nobody Promised You Tomorrow at the Brooklyn Museum. Um, I started doing these, um, I started doing works on fabric um, in 2008. Um, I, I had a lot of resistance um, during my BFA, my MFA, everyone was against it. Um, I was um, registered in the disabilities department and I, the teachers knew and I somehow like spoke to a teacher and I was like, I, I can't do it. I, you know, I don't think I can go through this. I don't think I can go through school. And, and she told me, well, let's do an independent study. And I found that everything I did was so, so extremely painful and so taxing for my body that, you know, I would, I would have been sitting down or um, still screening or doing anything in any class. And I would just run to the bathroom and cry in the middle of, um, of uh, the class. And I would just try to hide as much as I could being sick. Um, so I found that uh, the myriad of mediums I explore um, as, you know, in my bachelor's um, were against my body. And I found that fabric agreed with my body because it, uh, it functioned in an intimate uh, space of, um, of, you know, what Feliciano talks about. There's, there's this tenderness um, in fabric. It's such a... Um, it's such a light medium uh, that you know uh, agrees with uh, the the fragility of one's body, but um, in in the symbology that I want to show, I I, I want to carry the strength that is inside me, and I feel that Feliciano carried both through his works, his fragility and his strength. So I made uh, this work uh, was um, was not an artwork. So this is not art. This is my creative impulse. I I did this for a women's strike, um, and you know I was um, frustrated with um, the ownership of uh, of the state over uh, women's reproductive rights, and um, you know a lot of personal experiences um, with abuse, and you know gender violence that I grew up with. And the, there was this like new wave, this like new rise of, um, of like um, the status quo um, being okay with fascism existing in this country. And I went through that process. Um, I made this banner, we carry it in the street. And, and then with all the banners I made, I just decided to treat them as art material, as any fabric I would take, and I made works with them because um, I am, you know, I'm first a, a creative person, um, then 
I'm an artist, so I'm not an artist or an anti-artist. I follow my creative impulse. Um, so, um, obviously, I um, modify all the works. Uh, so this was the banners, and then they became the artworks. Um, and this image uh, was for the 30-year anniversary of Fact Up. I, I was part of a radical collective uh, that, uh, you know, provided support for different causes, and we were invited to the ACT UP 30-year anniversary march. Um, and I, um, I wanted to do um, something for the march, and I made this banner. Um, so um, I was obviously inspired um, in um, the the different uh, words that were the the, that were parts of the of the uh, rally and the um, and the um, discourse, um, you know, against um, uh, the AIDS crisis. So that is silence. Um, after anger comes action, and action is life. So I I really like the idea that if there's no action, we might as well be dead. It's our responsibility to do something, and if we don't do it, nobody else would. So um, I feel per personally responsible. Um, and I made this GIF <laughs> uh, for the Brooklyn Museum show, and I found Feliciano's uh, poem. So uh, Feliciano is very uh, creepy. He's like a ghost. Uh, it's almost like... Um, he's haunting me now because I started finding all these um, uh, uh, paths that were crossing with his work. Well, he's like this amazing looking guy. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, he looks so cool. And the banners we made, this is... Um, I, I really like this photograph because um, I met um, like some of the most amazing people there, uh, especially... Um, an elder that um, saw me folding the banner and he was like, oh, darling, let me do it. Like, you're doing a terrible <laughs> job. I work in fashion. And, and he, he took my banner and he treated it so uh, gently. I, I feel like I fell in love with him. <laughs> um, so again, um, actually, the collectors that uh, have this piece at home, they, it's... Um, um, it's, I think it's like one of, of it's a gay couple that, um, um, it's like half Colombian, of, half of the couple is Colombian, the other half is American, and I like that they have it. Um, when when, when um, the spouse got it as a present for, for his spouse, and he, he like exploded in tears when he saw it, um, it really, um, really, uh, you know, touches you when, um, you know, um, these like moments of trauma that they never go, uh, they're, they're, they never disappear, so it's like flashbacks. So um, just Feliciano's images. I don't want to hoard time, so I think, um, am I okay with time to speak about the passport, or are we? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So, um, I wanted to uh, destroy the idea of what a checkpoint means. I, I'm obviously very interested in uh, migration and you know um, myself having forever problems with migration. <laughs> um, there was um, this checkpoint uh, during the Second World War um, that I subverted, and I I wanted to you know make it um, something that looked very gay. Uh, so, you know, it was obviously, um, you know, black, white, and red, and I was like, what are uh, the happiest colors that we can have? Um, so, um, this is an installation with uh, pre-Columbian wallpaper uh, from Colombia, from the 1920s. Uh, it's, um, it's um, uh, the Puente. Um, bridge is the bridge that the indigenous people built before at the time they were still indigenous architecture uh, and 
I offered people a uh, passport uh, where they can renounce to gender borders and nationality, and uh, they are uh, with their own power, not with the power of any state. Um, so, yeah, um, I think, I think I am past my 10 minutes, probably. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the invitation, Aimee and Carolina and Gonzalo, Bill and Electra. It's a pleasure to talk to you and thank you all for coming out. Um, I wanted to, I mean, very few times in my life as an artist, I've had encounters with artists with whom you feel a great deal of identification. Um, even if your work looks nothing like the work of that artist. And um, I think the first time that happened to me was when I, um, somebody showed me the work of Las Yeguas del Apocalipsis, mm -hmm. and I discovered the work of Pedro Lemebel. And I don't have time to get into explaining who he was and what Las Yeguas was, but if you don't know, I recommend that you do that. Um, and it was in encountering that work that I, I realized that there was something in the work that I was trying to make that had not yet come to fruition, I hadn't found the voice that would allow me to speak from a, a place of intimacy and uh, an intuitive place, but also a place of anger. Um, the second time that happened was when I moved to New York and I encountered a retrospective of David Wonorowicz's work at the New Museum, which I think was like 95 or 96, something like that. Um, and then again, I, I saw in mostly in his writing, but also in all of his photography and graphic work, um, a voice that, you know, a, a mirror image, a, a something that I strive for, that I wanted to uh, potentially accomplish with his work. Uh, much more recently, I discovered through uh, a friend and then later on an exhibition that took place here and so on, the work of uh, Leon Nilsson. And uh, that was also a moment in which I understood that there was uh, something in, the, in expressing affect and sentiment uh, as opposed to what I had thought uh, were the most uh, potent um, strategies of communication, which were mostly uh, discourse and rage, um, that I understood that there was also something for me to, to learn. Uh, and then much more recently, I was introduced to the work of Feliciano Centurion through my friend Miguel Lopez. Uh, and I started to, to just look at this work and think about it in relationship to my life, but also think about it in relationship to today, which is uh, perhaps like every other uh, period in the history of the world, a very bleak time. And what it meant for me to see Feliciano's work and read Feliciano's work and understand it from the perspective of the situation that we're living globally today. Um, our, I guess I should go to my slides. <laughs> You have so many. <laughs> and then this. So. Connected. Interestingly, um, Feliciano uh, passed away in 1996, and the first work that I. The first artwork that I ever did was in 1996. Um, and I like the, the coincidence of the dates um, because I think um, also as a, as, a gay, as a gay man, I think I, I started to, um, in the early 90s, but mostly around 94, 95, 96, I started to understand that through, create, through a process of creativity and engaging with the, the making of forms and the making of images, I would be able to um, deal with a great deal of trauma and pain, and also trying to figure out who I was as a person, uh, trying to figure out my identity. And in this case, actually, it has not yet to do so much with sexuality uh, or gender identity. It has actually to do with uh, having lost my mother to brain tumors and the pain that that entailed. Um, she passed away in... 99, in 2001, but was sick for about 15 years. So I, I grew up with someone who was fading next to me for a very long time. 
Um, and uh, so this photograph, which is actually from uh, 98, that might be wrong, but around that time, is actually a photograph that I uh, did using all the props that she used during her illness um, to beautify herself from the effects of surgeries and radiations and things like that. So the wig that I'm wearing is actually the wig, wig that she wore, and the tape that is holding my lips up and, and uh, pulling up my, my eye, eyes is the tape that she used to uh, give herself spontaneous facelifts under the wig, which was a really kind of cute byproduct of having to wear a wig. Um, I continued exploring through photography. Um, also something that I think connects me to Feliciano's work, I found in creating these kinds of scenes uh, a way of identifying with things that were not necessarily human, or that were kind of creations of, of my imagination. And as I was seeing the work downstairs just now, I was thinking of the ways in which the octopus and all of these uh, animal and imaginary creatures may have also represented a way to uh, identify with beings that defy what we understand to be human, right? Uh, as we have perhaps been uh, abused and affected by the, the discrimination and hurt uh, placed upon, upon us by humans, maybe there are ways of identifying with different forms and figures that would defy uh, that relationship. I particularly like this one too, where I was uh, you know, disappearing my genitals, which is something that I wanted to do historically through my adolescent years of adolescence. Um, later on, I, I kind of shaped a different kind of discourse and visual strategies in, in my work. Um, but I think, like Feliciano, I understood that there were certain institutions and forms of oppression that I wanted to kind of uh, tackle uh, head on and, and deal with. Um, and the impact of the Catholic Church uh, on my body, on the social body, and on politics is something that has in, interested me uh, historically. Um, I was invited to do a performance work uh, for a performance festival in Italy, and uh, in the grounds where this performance festival was uh, taking place, which is a place called Tenuta de los Compiglio in, in Borno, in, in Tuscany, there was this uh, 18th century chapel which had that mural in the back. It, it's a desecrated chapel, um, which was used as an art space, but I, uh, I like the fact that it was a Franciscan chapel still kind of holding, holding space and reminiscing of, of, uh, of those years. Um, so I, I worked together with uh, Stefano Laforga and Andrea Ropes, who are two bondage artists, uh, one from Modena and one from Rome, and we did uh, a performative reenactment of Caravaggio's Crucifixion of St. Peter. Uh, and for those of you familiar with the story, St. Peter um, did not want to be crucified uh, right side up um, because he didn't think he was worthy of being crucified in the same way as Christ. And uh, I was also thinking of the myth around Caravaggio's sexuality, his relationship to, to uh, the commissioners of his work, his palette, etc. And um, decided to do this kind of like SNM-ish gay version of that work. There's supposed to be a video. Uh, should I do it again? Click again, I think. 1908. Scientists suggest that yet unnamed human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, was first transmitted from one chimpanzee to one human as early as 1908 in the southeastern corner of Cameroon. <laughs> As early as 
and the sun is going to expire in the 1960s. An HIV viral variant known as HIV-2 is found in West Africa and alleged to have transferred to humans from sooty Maccabay monkeys in Guinea-Bissau. Ladies and gentlemen, I I I have I have to do it. 1964. Jerome Horwitz of the Barbara Ann Carmanos Cancer Institute at Wayne State University School of Medicine synthesized zidobudine, AZT, a drug originally intended to treat cancer. Nineteen sixty six. Genetic studies of the HIV virus indicate that it first arrived in the Americas in nineteen sixty six, infecting a person in Haiti. Nineteen sixty nine. Robert R., a teenager from St. Louis, Missouri dies of an illness that baffles his doctors. Eighteen years later, molecular biologists at Tulane University would test samples of his remains and find evidence of HIV. The New York Times publishes its first article about HIV AIDS. Ladies and gentlemen, the New York Times understands the first article on HIV AIDS. Ladies and gentlemen. So this piece is actually 35 minutes, and I'm, I can't show it all. I just showed you a kind of like little edit. It's a collaboration with uh, Ted Kerr, who worked on the early part of this timeline from 1908 up to 1981. Uh, and then together with me, the timeline up to the present. Uh, it's, a piece, it's a piece called Legacy, um, where I'm also collaborating with Ari Shapiro, the radio anchor from NPR. And I think that the idea was for us to look at the construction of stories around uh, a timeline of the disease and the, sto the history that has been placed on our bodies as somebody who, who came of age sexually uh, in the midst of the crisis and has kind of had to learn how to deal with what that means uh, into the present. Um, so the three of us thought that it would be an interesting uh, project to think about expanding um, the idea of uh, where this came from, the, the kind of origin story that has been placed on our, sh on our shoulders, think, looking back, looking forward. Uh, looking through the holes that have been left out, uh, and at the same time thinking through the, the this idea of remembering, right? So that's the way that the piece is suggesting this this question of being told something by an official sounding voice, the voice of Ari, the voice of the media, and then struggling to remember it as with the muscle in in, in the voice. Um, this is a really recent work. This is actually from a couple of months ago. And uh, we also produced this timeline, which is basically the text of the piece um, that uh, people can take away when it's presented in an exhibition or, or elsewhere. Uh, and I guess to, to finish, I just wanted to think about the, the idea of the, again, of the idea of the really bleak times in which we are living today, and how this idea of thinking through Feliciano's work as a project of extending care and friendship and love uh, seem to me to be actual strategies of survival in ways that seem actually much more productive than anything else right now. As, as uh, we live in this kind of like new fear and panic around this so-called pandemic, as we live in a moment of realizing that perhaps most of this country uh, would prefer to go back to the neoliberalist kind of paradigm of the moderate uh, 
Democrats um, as we think about the ways in which bodies continue to be segregated and discriminated, perhaps looking at ways of you know, finding abrigo, of covering oneself with Felicianos' blankets, uh, it's actually an, a, a radical act of withdrawal, I think. And so I'm really kind of engaging with this idea of making work for those people you love, speaking to, to those people you care, and keeping in check with small, smaller communities of people that provide affect and ways of uh, kind of maintaining yourself uh, as opposed to necessarily engaging in a very public discourse. Thank you. Thank you, Electra, Carlos, and Bill. Um, I'm so glad I'm not the only one that feels uh, touched by the work of uh, Carlos. I thought I was in a middle life crisis and I was just being too soft. Um, I, I love the work of uh, Feliciano, and I, I just wanted to read, you know, one of the um, one of the um, texts on, on one of the works. It says, "En el silencio descanso mi sangre, en el silencio del descanso mi sangre fluye. Solo tu amor en un acto de fe puede salvarme. Only your love in an act of faith can save me." Right, and it just reminds me also how everything sounds so much more beautifully in Spanish than in English. <laughs> <laughs> That's a different panel. Um, the, the, the question I wanted to ask all of you, and you know, there's these ideas of um, sort of Feliciano's work can be seen as pages of a very personal, intimate diary, but also banners, you know, political banners, and also as you know, ways of asking for um, help and support. Um, but at the beginning, I was very taken, you know, but what you said, Bill, with this idea of um, trying to bridge cultural differences between the two shows. Mm -hmm. And the question is, which the two of you have um, so brilliantly um, sort of proved, what does it mean to bridge also across time, right? And there were moments, the work of Feliciano was done in a very specific way with very specific str struggles and traumas, and how those can be connected across, you know, time. Discuss. <laughs> <laughs> well, it does seem that when you, when I talk to people who were um, born, who are in their 20s now, trying to get what those years, what the worst years when, of the, when, when, when folks were dying in such a rapid pace, other than Yes, it was really sad and really painful. And trying to figure out what are the actual lessons. And um, I went to, there's a, a movie that was made in the 90s called Pride Divide about how the gay male community and the lesbian community came together specifically around uh, HIV activism and how whether that legacy was gonna stay. And I went with a friend who's my, actually my website designer who's like 23 and he brought a couple of his lesbian friends with him. And he looked at me like, like what, 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 what is this movie about? Uh, of course, we're like all together in this. And, um, and I was like trying to explain like, though there was times before the epidemic hit when the idea of caring for each other was just a really foreign concept. And now I was talking a little bit about the, in the show that you were in at the Brooklyn Museum, the No One Promised You Tomorrow, the, um, the, the republication of the faggots and their friends between revolutions, which ends with, we have to take care of each other. Nobody else is gonna take care of us. And so I think, when I try to think of what that legacy is, that when we look at an artist like Feliciano, um, or one year of it, or that it's like that idea of the lesson of like, we have to take care of each other is the lesson that sort of gets handed down to me. And also, and that we also have to find ways to enjoy life, because it's not like, there isn't a sort of constant next crisis going on. And the idea of needing to recommit on a daily basis to taking care of each other is the lesson I like to learn from that period. We're going in order. <laughs> um, I would draw parallels um, with um, the dictatorships in Latin America in the 70s. And, and uh, that, that pain and that terror that uh, Feliciano had to go through, even he's not mentioning uh, this in his work, 
but um, the I mean this is uh, very clear um, when um, the the dictatorship um, uh, in Paraguay um, it's um, it's not that uh, uh, known in pop culture um, the horrors that happened in Paraguay because it's a smaller country uh, we know about Pinochet, uh, it's all over the place. We know about um, Argentina. And, and for him living uh, through this dictatorship in his childhood, uh, through the changes uh, through a um, democratic state in 89, and then going to Argentina, which didn't have a different political situation, um, going today um, in Colombia, where the um, the ONU just uh, called out uh, Colombia because um, um, there's uh, the riot police are inside the schools. It makes me think of of, of Buenos Aires uh, when the riot police went into the schools. Um, so the ONU is like. Um, what, what's up? You can't do that. This is not allowed. And, you know, Colombia State, it's like, you know, fuck you, no. we, we, we don't listen to you. There's definitely uh, a, a legacy of, uh, of um, the, uh, being uh, the children of uh, the dictatorship in our countries that we share. And, and that has... Um, um, uh, I personally feel um, that in Colombia it, it hasn't changed and uh, I, I speak in my work from that trauma and from the trauma of uh, the people I know that uh, were tortured in prison and were exiled and from the people I, I know whose parents were murdered and were disappeared uh, and from um, you know, from um, this like shared threat. And I think uh, we can't avoid it. And it's very, it's radically different. We're talking about the history of, uh, of US Latinos from Latino immigrants. We are from uh, very different cultures. And, and I think what's, this is what we share uh, with Feliciano is we have, uh, we have a similar history, even though it's like 20, 30 years later. Yeah. Should we? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things that I've been uh, interested in doing through some of the other work that I didn't show is looking at um, very old cases of queer lives documented in archives and um, not because I'm nostalgic or I want to have a conversation with the dead, although it has been fun to have a conversation with <laughs> like that. Um, but mostly because I, I started to be really suspicious about this idea of progress and this idea that, that uh, queer lives are better off today than they have been before. And uh, through a series of documentary-based projects uh, about the present, uh, I realized that I wanted to really look back and have a kind of uh, conversation across times um, an intergenerational conversation and understanding the kind of the terms of, of the narration of queer lives. Um, so I've done a ton of work looking at colonial archives and seeing the ways in which uh, the legal and the moral frameworks of, um, of um, the 15th through the 18th century uh, defined very much the terms that we continue to endure today in terms of what is immoral, what is illegal, um, what are the lives that are worth uh, being lived or worth living. Uh, so in that sense, I feel that, um, you know, when I look at Feliciano or I look at Martina Parra, one of the characters that I, I have worked on in one of the archives who lived in the 18th century, I see mirrors, mirror images, mirror stories. Um, and when I look at my life, I think I see the same, even if it has been one which many more privileges uh, of, you know, self-representation. Uh, so I, I, I have a sense that, you know, this, this idea of, of um, uh, a kind of um, 
epistolary or kind of discursive relationship with with uh, our histories is really important to uh, understanding the place from which we speak as individuals, but also uh, collectively. Thank you. So uh, one of the things that keep coming up is the idea of anger, the idea of disappearance, nostalgia. But the one thing that appears all the time in Feliciano's work is the idea of hope, which I don't see um, happening a lot in the work that I see these days. And I wanted to hear you know, from two contemporary artists and somebody that curates a lot of contemporary art, have we lost hope? And that's what makes us connect so much with um, Feliciano's work. Anybody? Um, <laughs> I, have, I have to say that I love that Feliciano loved Cuba. He was completely um, fascinated by, by Cuba. And I, I saw this as a sign of, of hope. He never adhered to... Um, to any um, societal neoliberal constraints or standards, you know, at, at, at the time of the of the Cold War, he was he was um, you know there as a as a gay man embracing it, um, and I think that um, thinking about Cuba, I have to say something uh, that's very important that a Cuban said. I, I don't, I don't want to, um, I don't want, like, I don't believe in heroes or things like that, but that um, it's important to be angry. <laughs> it's very important to be angry. That's why I put it in the banner. Um, and I think, um, I think that um, that that um, having that responsibility and having that anger against uh, against uh, terrorism, terrorism uh, of state and violence, uh, whatever that for of that form of violence uh, might be, uh, you know, violence can be poverty, uh, racism. Um, you know, um, uh, physical violence, uh, emotional violence. Um, I think that we are so um, we are so bothered by this that we're we're pushed into action in many different ways. So I I think I think there is hope. I would never say I would never feel there was no hope in Feliciano's work. Uh, I think, I think saying that there's no hope it's a very counter-revolutionary <laughs> thing to say. Um, and um, you have this banner that says you are so much more than your trauma, right? Yeah. I see that as a hope. Yes, I refuse to be uh, a victim, uh, whatever it may be. Uh, you know, um, yeah. I think we have to be carried to action, um, you know, a cada uno de acuerdo con sus capacidades. I don't know who said that, Marx. Everyone according to their um, capacities. Um, yeah. Abilities? Capabilities. Uh, capabilities. capabilities. <laughs> you know, I see, um, I remember the, the wars that took place when people started making work about AIDS, about what the appropriate response was. And I've written, and other essays in other places about um, when they Guggenheim opened the twin retrospectives of Ross Blechner and Felix Gonzalez Torres, that the only thing that brought them together was they were both working with HIV issues. And then like we'd go into like these, I remember just going to like parties and fights would break out about who had the more appropriate response. And I sort of see that today also, but, and I'm seeing a lot of work about loving chosen families. Like there was uh, Daron Langberg, had a big painting at Bo showed Boski of just all of these people he loved in his life, men, women, gay, straight, hanging out on a beach. And uh, and it was like thinking like, oh yeah, that's the beauty of life. And then I look at, at the last show of TM Davey uh, with the Fire Island images and this, this image of like, what I can do is like celebrate these people that I love that are around me. And you know, is that um, an apolitical response? Is it just like being like, I'm just going to take this little joy and this little loving community I have. 
but sometimes it feels the most appropriate response is what you, you celebrate the love you have and try to um, nurture that. Yeah, I mean, it is really difficult to be hopeful right now, I think. But I'm, I'm also been having a really bad week when it, comes, <laughs> when it comes to that. We'll give you a hug after that. Thank you. But um, I guess I wanted to talk about something else. I'm, I'm not entirely sure what the art world in Argentina was in the 90s. Um, but I can imagine, and I've, I've read a little bit about it. And I feel like we also live in a very different art world right now. And I was thinking about myself, like, you know, I'm, I'm someone who's making a living professionally as an artist and as an educator. Uh, but I also have to deal with the demands of those two institutions, right? Uh, the demands of a commercial uh, market that is like a shark that wants to eat you alive, right? That you have to feed and make concessions and negotiate mm -hmm. with and so on and so forth. And then the demands of an institutional system in academia that does similar things. So I think that the, you know, I, I greatly admire work like that, you know, or work by people who can continue to find, you know, um, a voice that comes from a place of intuition and a place of, of sensibility and that doesn't turn cynical and sour in the face of so much adversity. Right. And I speak from a place of privilege. I show with galleries. I have a market. I have a job as, an, as a full-time professor. What, you know, all of those things. And may, but maybe it is because I have those privileges or hindrances in a way that uh, I find the idea that existing in this world is actually really, really um, challenging. You know, it's something that you have to constantly uh, find the means of survival, not to become sour and angry. And and uh, you know, walking out, walking into an art fair is basically a nightmare from hell, right? <laughs> for for, yes. an, for an for an artist, because it just really goes against all of your uh, most you know inner beliefs of who you are and why you make work and who you want your work to be for, right? Um, and instead, it you know it becomes this commodity thing, and it goes to the hands of someone who uh, may or may not like the work, may want it for the right or the wrong reason, and I feel like like. Um, you know, Feliciano and Leonilson and so on, they, they interface with that kind of system as well, but it did not define the, the context in which they produced. And I feel like, uh, or at least I do right now, and it is really, a, a, it's, it's really hard to kind of um, survive the, the forces of that, even if it is also a great privilege to be able to do it. So it's, there's like a contradiction that you have to deal with in uh, in terms of one's sensibility as a creative person. Thank you. Bill, you said um, in the galleries um, a moment ago um, that for many artists, um, the moment of being diagnosed was a moment of liberation, yeah. right? And I wanted to hear a little bit more about that, and I wanted to hear from the two of you, which are your moments of liberation, and when do they come? Yeah, well, I mean, this was what we were talking about, Omar Shirilio, um, yeah. cause, um, and but also, um, it's true with Leo Neeson, too, because Lee Neeson's work changed really radically after his diagnosis. He, before, was doing for sort of very brightly colored, cartoony, what we would describe as these philo sensibility paintings. And then after his diagnosis, he started doing the most profound work of the, the sewn work. And I, um, and I learned this concept on that first trip in 93 to Argentina. And, when, and Gumi Meyer is the one who he had noticed it because he was you know, with Omar. And, um, and then I just started seeing it everywhere. And I, um, there's an art historical discourse around the late work after someone's already made their mark um, and they actually get to do what they want to do. And one of the things about being in the art world for as many decades as I have is I've watched my friends give themselves permissions, usually after they turn about 60, suddenly even with their there's no particular health condition, they suddenly are like, wait, I'm tired of making work for other people. And now I do try to transmit that when I'm visiting grad students. I'm like, you know, you don't have to wait till you're 60 to make work to please yourself. Uh, and it's probably a better strategy to begin with. Um, but that concept is something I, I learned. In the Argentine art world of that period, it was interesting because there were a very small group of collectors who supported everything. And there were a group of galleries like Benzikar that were where the power was. And the Rojas group um, were sort of 
opposed to that. And they were like, they're like, we're just gonna make these crazy environments and do this stuff, and we don't care if the market cares. And of course, once you say, I don't care about the market, the market loves you. Uh, and most of those artists were actually, all got picked up by the best galleries in Buenos Aires. And there were these like dueling collectors. And my first trip, I was invited to stay at Jorge Health's house, who was on the board of MoMA and right then. And I was studying my Argentine art history book that uh, my host had given me and realizing that there were paintings in the book that were in this room where I'm eating breakfast. Uh, and, but then when I came back into the super gay show, none of those power people came to it. Um, and they were like, they could handle the Rojas group, but they were like, uh, that's, uh, that show was a little over the top for them. Um, but I still love this idea of the liberation that happens when you give yourself permission to do what you want to do. Um, I, I don't think there's, um, I don't think there's any liberation. Um, I think, uh, right now there's only resistance and, and resistance, um, will lead us somewhere important. It's not a passive word. Resistance is, uh, being very active, um, to say it in a romantic way, uh, you know, resistance could be, um, you know, what I was saying before, like Feliciano uh, dancing in, in Cuba under um, homophobic um, military and police force. Um, I, I don't believe that's liberation, but that's resistance. And, and in, in the same way, I, I feel like um, we have to be, uh, resisting every day actively and where I found liberation. Okay, uh, mm -hmm. I have to say something. It's very liberating uh, getting a, a diagnosis. It's very, very liberating. Uh, knowing that you have to embrace it and um, knowing that that there's finally an answer. I think, I think it's a point of liberation. In illness, I, I don't wanna speak for Feliciano. Uh, there's a huge, huge, huge struggle, but I feel like there's, um, there's a sort of climax and anti-climax in, in, uh, in knowing that that's it. That's uh, what's happening. I think it's very liberating. And I, I'm speaking um, from a point of, you know, being um, chronically ill and uh, disabled. Um, it's just, um, you learn that your, your life changed, that's liberating. So, you know, that's the only place where I could tie it to Feliciano's work. But yeah, I, think uh, he lived through resistance, as I hope I am. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think I, I do believe that no, no one will be free until all men, women, and others are yeah. free, right? But, but at the same time, I think we all find our spaces of liberation uh, in personal spaces, right? When you kiss the person you love, and when you walk down the street with your friend, when you have sex. So I feel like, to me, th those are like mini liberatory moments that happen on a day-to-day -day basis which keep you going. So we have some time for questions from the audience. And we have a microphone here, so if you can raise your hand and wait for the microphone to get to you. Hi, I got here a little bit late, so I don't know if this was already addressed, um, but I'm really curious about the use of animals in the work, not just um, in the textile works, but also the sculptural uh, small animals that have um, abrigos on them and what that symbolizes. A lot of them are also dinosaurs, which brings up this idea of extinction, but I'm hoping you can speak to that. Um, I only heard it from Feliciano's friends. Um, it was a form of deconstructing what is uh, decorative 
uh, decorative and kitsch being as something that's very, very low in society and turning, turning that around in a, into a subversive language and making it beautiful. So um, when I know uh, only about the example of the catfish, um, which it's supposed to be the, the most, it's supposed to be the ugliest fish, but what his friends were saying was that he he would he would love to make everything beautiful and he he had the the capacity of even making a catfish beautiful um so uh, i think it was uh that juncture on where, what are the elements of kitsch of decoration uh, and and you know um transforming that into art but i i don't know if that's from the information I got. I don't know if someone has more depth. Well, just in, in, if, in the documentary it. film that's downstairs, he talks about finding his source fabrics. He loved the markets, and he loved the markets in Paraguay where he grew up. And he was really interested in what people chose to make their lives more beautiful. And uh, all of those images are ones he would find in the market. And he said, you know, it was my, he's like, his, in the film he talks about his, like, his aunts and mother would, would buy these fabrics. And then he started looking at how, the, what, how, the, how odd those choices were when you think about them. So if you get a chance, the, the film is about an hour and 20 minutes, if I remember, and it's really good. And you get to hear his voice. Any other questions? Well, then, what I suggest is... I have one, one more. Of course, <laughs> please. I, you know, I also love this idea of contradiction that appears in the work of um, Feliciano, right? You know, saying these very strong, powerful things, but almost, you know, embedding them in these beautiful, almost banal sort of um, embroideries that usually nobody pays attention. Um, is that something that uh, resonates with the work of um, the two of you? Or? 100%. <laughs> I also had a question that relates to what Gonzalo just asked. It was specifically for Electra. You said something really clear when you were showing your slides. You showed a banner and you said, this is not art. And you said it several times, this is not art. And I was curious uh, how you think about that because at Visual Aids, of course, we think of activist pieces as art. That's something that, that is part of what we do. And so I was curious about how you were differentiating between art and not art in your own practice around activism? Um, um, I, I am a radical, I am not an activist. Um, uh, I, in the same tone, I don't believe uh, in charity, I believe in solidarity. I really like a, a quote that I found that I modified. Uh, we are neither artists nor anti-artists. We are creative women, revolutionaries. I want to uh, talk about the creative force that uh, that uh, people from um, from the uh, Lasco caves had, and 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 that every human being has this creative impulse. This quote is by um, New York. Um, movement that occupied um, the, the MoMA in the 70s up against the wall motherfuckers. Um, and um, I want to, I want to, um, the, the context can inform the work, but, but I, um, I, I, don't, I never want to lie. I always like to be uh, transparent I, I didn't do these uh, banners with that intention. I did it with a, with a pure uh, drive, and, and that was the only way I felt I could contribute. Uh, and, and I thought, I can, I, can give, uh, I can give this, and this is necessary, so this would be my role. After having them, I only used them as materials. And, and they became artworks when I had that intention. I used uh, the banner as any fabric I would find, and this was my intention. I'm gonna, I'm gonna transform this, and this is gonna be a piece. 
but it wasn't originally a piece. And I think that it's very important for an artist um, to, to, to honor that thing that um, the, the work, first of all, it's always an experiment. Second, it's always a surprise. If I, if I create something with my mind and the result is exactly what was in my mind, that's an illustration. So uh, there is no value to that. That's um, something, you know, that's commercial. And I think as, as an artist, I have the uh, responsibility of being a narrator of of my time, um, so I think uh, I think uh, this is what happened from this experiment. Yeah. I just wanted to highlight something that Carlos brought up almost on passing, uh, which I think is very important in the contemporary context of reading Centurion's works today, not just this year, but today. I think it's. Uh, it's an important work to also think about the returns of pandemics, like you said, and the ideas of, you know, like the hysteria that happens around like a disease like the one that is developing. Of course, we all have to take care of each other, but I think that Centurion's work, as you mentioned, is very important in terms of uh, thinking about protection and shelter and refugee and abrigo, you know, through affect and through love and through this excess of beauty and excess of affectiveness, um, which, I hope it's a message also to what's happening. And maybe we can finish with a line from Feliciano that says, Dejo que el amor me guíe. You know, I let love um, guide me. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you. Uh, please join us for more talks and over some wine next door in our, in our reception. And I also wanted to let everybody know that in May we're going to have the monograph for the okay. first time of Feliciano Centurion. So Yay. please be on the lookout. Yay.